that's very helpful. Um, we'll record this event so that we can share it with the people that come and more widely afterwards. Um, yeah, so the, the question for us is which are the technologies that can help us enable regenerative change? Um, and so we've got some great speakers lined up who are all interested in this question and have slightly different angles on the hotspots of value of where technology can really play a transformative role in change and what are the specific tools that they're using that might demonstrate that value in the world. Um, and I'm going to hand, hand over to them to introduce themselves and do some short lightning talks about um, about the technologies that they're interested in and the questions that they've got in relation to that. Um, but before I do, I just wanna say uh, welcome. And if you're listening, um, feel free to capture any questions or reactions that you might have in the chat. We're gonna uh, pop you into breakout rooms for a short amount of time after all of the lightning talks so that you'll have a chance to think about what are the questions and reactions that you're coming with um, before a bit of a Q&A session at the end. Um, but yeah, I think let's kick off. And uh, yeah, without further ado, I'll pass over to uh, Fergus first, I think, who'll be our first lightning talk. And Cheers, Daniel. Yeah, over to you. Hi, everyone. Uh, so I'm Fergus Arkley, uh, and I'm the digital innovation for uh, an innovation manager at an organization called Power to Change. So Power to Change is an independent trust which strengthens communities by supporting something called uh, community businesses. Now, some of you might be familiar with the term, others might not, but basically community businesses are businesses that are run by the community for the community. Now they're rooted in a place and they're addressing a community need. Now they're very pluralistic. It can be from bakeries to skate parks, solar farms through to community, community centers. So there's, you know, they're, they're, the range is, is infinite basically, you know, everything can be owned by the community you know, in a way. Um, and none of them are the same. They're all different. They all differ uh, hugely. And so there's a very pluralistic nature across them. And over the years, we've been seeing lots of examples of where communities are sort of standing up to and making change in face of the current tech paradigm. So where they're being let down by the corporate offer, so they're not getting value for money, or the, tim the tools that are available simply just don't meet their needs. Um, and it, a lot. Some of the times, it's going against the very values that they've been set up for. Um, so, we've been seeing this sort of bottom-up response where communities uh, are making the decision to do things differently and take control and develop their own community tech. So, I, I want to sort of start with a question to all of you to sort of like um, to think about. So, but what if we already had all the technology we needed? And the biggest challenge for unshackling and releasing the potential of technology isn't about making more stuff, but equitably distributing the technologies we already have. Um, what could we do if we shifted from this extractive sort of paradigm around technology we're in now, be that, you know, extracting our data, is it the precious metals from the earth or is it IP, you know, to a more sustainable, regenerative or restorative technologies that empower local decision-making and build community wealth, improve skills, and sort sort of the, the, the some of those really sticky problems. Now, the thing that I, the sort of liberty tech that I want to talk about is something called community tech. And it's more, rather than a piece of technology, it's more of an approach. So when we talk about community tech, we're thinking about like hardware and software that delivers a benefit to a community group and for which that community group has the authority to influence or control. So that influence and control can come in different ways. They have either created it, made it, they own it, or they may be part, part of something like a cooperative where they have a say and a vote over the, over the direction of that piece of technology. Like in its broadest sense, uh, community tech is, is social and technical innovation. And it meets a need, need that the market or the state will not and should not be the, the, the default provider for. So it can be, um, it can be like hardware or software, like I said, that, that a community group makes itself, or it can be part of an open source or community managed software that several different groups are managing. Uh, it can be place-based or it can be of a, uh, of a community of shared experience. Um, so from power to change perspective, we do look at it more from a place-based perspective, for, but we do understand that, you know, community tech is a lot broader than just place. So, Community tech sort of creates value that sticks to a place. It builds social capital, creates good jobs and alternative support systems. Um, it 
it, so in the context of the sort of climate collapse, it's equipping communities to be resilient and sustainable to meet their own needs, which is going to be essential. And in the context of like a shrinking economy and increased social division, it's an alternative infrastructure that binds people together, uh, which we find is essential. Um, and one of the key things about uh, community tech and what's most liberating about it is, is about working in the open. And this is across the full spectrum of working in the open, simply from sharing the work that you're doing with other organizations through like wheat notes or blogs, uh, doing service recipes. So giving people a template about and how you can replicate and reuse the resources that you're using, right through to utilizing Creative Commons and sharing IP and code. Um, so we think that like, so it's like shifting the whole idea about ownership and removing the walls from development. So a lot of the time, in the proprietary world, you know, it's all about putting up these barriers, so protecting your IP. But this is about shifting to a non-proprietary position, so truly liberating tech so it's open to all. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I think there's over 2 billion pieces of of work that's out there under the uh, Creative Commons. So, you know, it's a growing, growing field. So it's, um, it's I mean, I, I'm, I spend a lot of time in and around this world, and I, I just can't I sort of iterate enough about how liberating it is. I mean, I think it's worth me sort of I've got a bit of time left to share an example of community tech. So I live in Bristol and we have a, we have lots of community tech examples in Bristol, but there's one called uh, the Bristol Cable, which is a community business, which is a, an award winning community media organization. So it does investigative journalism and it's owned by two and a half thousand subscribing members in Bristol. Uh, and what they do is... Um, so they have this, because it's a cooperative, it's managed by the members and they couldn't find an off the shelf product that met their unique needs. What they wanted was they wanted data sovereignty. So they wanted to own their own data. They wanted to have voting uh, rights. They wanted to have uh, engagement alongside membership management. So being able to like change how much you're donating or, you know, change your address, always in, in one system. And there was basically nothing on the shelf, off the shelf. So they developed their own and it included, uh, they called it a membership management system. So similar to a CRM. And it was able to do payment subscriptions. They were able to do member engagement. So tailoring the content, you, you could tailor which bits of content you wanted, but you could also contribute. So if you'd seen a story that you wanted to investigate, you could add that. Um, and it sort of enabled act, like passive members to suddenly become active within the realms of the, of the cable. So it sort of really improved the democratic, uh, democratic, uh, democratic input within governance. So people could vote on the directors they want to be voted in. They could um, uh, vote on the direction of the reporting. And it really bound together all the different bespoke elements. Uh, and it sort, of, it sort of freed up the organization to create it so that um, it really thought about membership power in terms of community journalism. But the key thing here as well, it, it was that all this tech was done in the, in the open open source. So you might think, well, you know, they've done that. What's what's the value of that? But there's, there's a, a partnership of different newsrooms from across Europe have now taken on the same piece of technology and are utilizing it. And the, the, the beauty of this is, is that they can then go off and refine another piece of the puzzle. And then that piece of the puzzle is then be able to fit into everyone else's. So you're building on top of the shoulders of others. And um, so it's been developed also as a sort of service, uh, a software as a service. So you can actually just buy, you can purchase a license to, to, to use it rather than having to do the quite technical parts of actually serving your own um, software. So... That's um, sort of a good example of community tech. Um, and really, I just want to leave you with a sort of a question or a bit of tension around this. And it's around the cultural perspective around working in the open and open source. And it comes down to this like abundancy and scarcity. And I think in the sector that we're in, there is a lot of scarcity. So how do we move people to this idea of abundance and being able to share and being able to share and understand that people will work alongside them and the benefits that come from open source? I think that's my eight minutes, so uh, I'm happy to answer any questions at the end. Thank you so much, Fergus. It was so compelling that my cat came to listen <laughs> during the talk, so that's a good sign. Um, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> gather any questions, any reactions that you've got, put them in the chat or hold on to them and we'll have a chance to ask them at the end. Um, but yeah, Deepa, over to you. Uh, to yeah, yeah, thank you. So I'll just 
begin with a quick introduction of, of me. I'm always worked at, I'm a social entrepreneur and I've always worked at the intersection of technology and social impact. I was previously leading uh, philanthropy for Salesforce Foundation. And I got into Web3 in 2021 in crypto. Uh, and it was a massive crypto fundraiser that got my attention uh, into Web3, like a billion dollars was donated by Vitalik Buterin, and that was this in a sheep in a meme coin, and that was you know the largest donation ever made on a single day, and so that got my attention. I started tracking crypto's social impact, and I got um, in 2022 early uh, around uh, uh, Feb end of Feb, I got deep into decentralized autonomous organizations. So this is a uh, um, you know Web three native organizations formed entirely on the internet, strangers coming together around a shared mission and uh, accomplishing tasks and getting work done. And I really got interested in impact DAO. So these are uh, basically DAOs that are formed for impact. So there are different kinds of DAOs, but these are DAOs that are formed for impact. And my interest point uh, uh, was, uh, you know, it started with Ukraine DAO, and I really got deep into it. And I wanted to understand them and really understand the operating structure on the internet uh, and uh, unlock those learnings for change makers. And so I formed a DAO myself to do that because I wanted to even live a DAO life and experience it and just, you know, learn from uh, hands on building the organization. Uh, so so we, uh, so 22 people on the internet came together like complete strangers and we worked and researched 12 impact DAOs uh, you know, really deeply. We had like 40, 40 conversations with impact DAO builders, which are both founders and contributors. And we wrote a book together as a DAO. So I've like really learned a lot from my experience of running a DAO as well as uh, um, you know, learning about these organizations deeply. And uh, one of the technologies that really struck me uh, after I studied many of these organizations and how they were using tokens for governance, and those were like financial tokens, uh, like there were two DAOs that launched with a financial token, and that token uh, was uh, what was, uh, you know, in, uh, was also a governance token. So people could just buy those tokens on a decentralized exchange um, and they could have a say in an organization. And I found that very discomforting. I'm like, how can people without having skin in the game can start participating in governance? And, uh, or, you know, is it only for people who can afford it? Because, you know, if you have money and uh, you can just go buy the token and start having, you know, deciding on the governance matters of an organization. So that was something that really uh, came out from that study. And we saw that a lot of impact DAOs were a very token averse. They didn't want to launch a financial token ever, but there were a couple that had launched and this is how they were running their governance. And, um, and they were like, most of them were like, we would never ever do a financial token, but we would love to account the time of our contributors, you know, how much time they're putting into these organizations. And around that same time came the paper uh, called the Soul Bond Tokens paper, which was co-authored by the founder of um, Ethereum uh, with Alec Buterin. And he talked about the concept of Soul Bond Tokens, which comes from the Soul Bond items in World of Warcraft. Um, which is a game, a multiplayer game, where you have to complete certain quests to earn soulbound items, and that cannot be transferred. Like they're more valuable than the purchased items, and so that's where the concept of soulbound tokens uh, originated. And the whole idea was that uh, you need to earn your way into a community. You know, you need to earn your right to vote. You need to earn your right to govern. You cannot just simply go and buy it. And also um, it helps build on-chain reputation. You know, like when people start earning these soul bond tokens, like some place they've volunteered and they've given, they've got a soul bond token, some place they've made a donation or they're a subscriber of a certain service. All these little, little information helps form the on-chain identity of the person. And in Web3, we believe the world is going on-chain because it has many advantages. It's completely verifiable. It's in public, if it's on a public blockchain and most of these dope tokens are on a public blockchain so uh, the uh, the future is going to be on chain uh, and especially like with education credentials and uh, you know certificates being issued by uh, people offering courses or uh, institutes could all be as a soul bound token because these are tokens that are earned and they cannot be transferred so that makes them non-financial 
tokens and you can just think of them as uh, nfts like most most people are aware of nfts for all the bad reasons uh in the sense that you know like it really took off in 2021 people were buying non-fungible tokens to trade and speculate but uh, nfts have many use cases beyond you know what the mainstream media it's always in the mainstream media for speculative purposes you know you buy these monkey jpegs and you speculate with it but nfts have so many implications and uh, you can think of soul bond tokens as nfts because there's a visual representation on chain um but they're non-transferable and they're earned so i feel like they're going to really enable uh communities uh and especially impact communities that uh where people on the internet come around meaning rather than money you know the meaning or the purpose of that organization is the incentive why people come and join digital communities and then how do these communities most of them are bootstrapped initially uh, and are volunteer driven then how do you recognize uh, the contribution of those members so soul bond tokens is one way of recognize recognizing or accounting for your contributors time and then based on the time investment uh, these communities can then start to decentralize they could say if you've invested x number of hours you get to vote on certain matters or if you invest more than x number of hours a week you can get to vote on more operating or core matters of the organization so it it leads to or it enables collective decision making you know and uh, in in the world of web3 these are our principles and as decentralized autonomous organizations you know this uh, you may start as a community with a couple people leading but then you can slowly start using soul bond tokens to decentralize uh, your community and be more collectively governed because you know uh, that's where the world is moving more bottom up a decentralized fashion of running organizations on the internet Yeah, if you have any questions, I'm happy to uh, answer later. But soul bond tokens are very easy to issue. I just issued one uh, myself. Like I'm not, uh, I don't do smart contracts or anything. Like I'm not a developer. I just work at the intersection. I understand technologies really well. And I can communicate that to uh, to change makers and I can speak the language. So that's been my area of uh, work. But, uh, you, you know, we wrote this book, Impact That Book, and people were still were like, we need to really you know, a book is great, but is there a more guided approach? And we just uh, um, launched a course, uh, which is like the distillation of all our learnings uh, from these 12 organizations. And we continue to study more organizations across decentralized science, network state, and uh, climate and social impact organizations on, um, on the internet. And so the book, uh, the course is a distillation of all the learnings from this book and how one can, like a basic foundation course on starting digital communities and as part of uh, you know people who completed that course and uh, took the assessment we issued soul bond tokens which are uh, basically just attestation that uh, you know they've completed the course and now they can successfully uh, start and impact now at least the basics you know so yeah they're, they're really fascinating I think the future of educational you know credentials everything is going to move skills is going to move on chain and SPTs will enable that Amazing. Thank you, Deepa. Yeah, fascinating. Um, yeah, again, please capture any um, thoughts or questions. And yeah, Deepa, if you could share a link to the, the course you're developing, I think that would be great in the chat so people can get more of a sense of that. Um, okay, I'm going to hand over to Justin next. Justin, over to you. Hey, y'all. Uh, I'm going to start with um, by reading a piece. Um, and it's called The 11th Hour. And it's a prophecy of a happy elder. Uh, so I invite you to kind of open your mind, open your heart, and open your ears, and just let the words wash over you. Um, you've been telling the people that this, the 11th hour, is coming. Now you must go back and tell the people that this is the hour. And there are things to be considered. Where are you living? What are you doing? What are your relationships? Are you in right relation? Know your garden. It is time to speak your truth. Be good to each other. And do not look outside yourself for the leader. This could be a good time. 
There's a river flowing now very fast. It's so great and swift that there are those who will be afraid. They will try to hold on to the shore. They will feel they are being torn apart and they will suffer greatly. Know the river has its destination. The elders say, we must let go of the shore, push off into the middle of the river, keep our eyes open and our heads above water. And I say, see who is with you and celebrate. At this time in history, we are to take nothing personally, least of all ourselves. For the moment we do, our spiritual growth and journey come to a halt. The time of the lone wolf is over. Gather yourselves. Banish the word struggle from your attitude and vocabulary. All that we do now must be done in a sacred manner and in celebration. We are the people we have been waiting for. Yeah, my name is Justin Joseph Taylor, and uh, I'm one of seven founding members of Samaras Trust, which is a uh, heart source library uh, that practices multi capital contribution counting um, and the Web3 space. I'm also a facilitative founder, so facilitative founder of Samara Sanctuary Studio. Um, and these are both second and third generation DAOs originating from the regenerative economic ecosystem called Seeds and the larger regenerative renaissance movement. I'm also a Huddlecraft host fellow and I'll be launching my huddle uh, this fall. And the huddle is a peer-to-peer -peer learning journey if you don't know. And that huddle is themed humans being humans at work. Uh, an exploration in new ways of working that honor the individual, provide for the community or organization, and serve humanity and the earth in harmony. Um, uh, these orgs and their body of work um, are all responses, you know, really to this time of, of collapse and change. Um, I think Fergus and, and Deepa have both kind of talked about some of the change and collapse, but also new ways of organizing coming together in really meaningful ways. And we can think about this time of change and collapse as actually a time of regeneration. Uh, of death and rebirth. Um, and, and our kind of sense, what we center around is this belief that by creating digital, social and organizational spaces, um, we can help people learn to let go of the shore, uh, swim in the river with their eyes and heads above water and, and be able to celebrate those around them. Um, so for the last three years or so, uh, we've been experimenting learning with how Web3 uh, particularly the technology and the culture around cryptocurrency, currency, blockchains, and DAOs can be a bridge from our current civilization to the next. Um, and to do so in a way that aligns with living systems and offers safety, stability, and support for individuals um, and collective learning. Um, so specifically, we have uh, had the opportunity to work with the digital, social, and organizational infrastructure uh, called SEEDS, uh, which is a regenerative economic ecosystem designed to use regenerative principles and practices to model a new civilization. And so some examples of kind of a digital uh, infrastructure is they have a cryptocurrency called Seeds as well that is intentionally kept affordable. So it's not sold on open markets exchanges. It's actually only designed to be built and exchanged within its own economy. Um, and it's done so so that local farmers, you know, no matter what, where you are in the economic system across the world, you can have access and affordability to be able to buy this cryptocurrency and step into being able to use it. Um, they build on the Telos and EOS blockchain, so it has zero carbon emissions and also no gas fees, which also make it um, approachable and available for anyone to be able to access and use it. Um, and they design things like a light wallet. And the light wallet actually allows for people to move from uh, being a visitor to a citizen um, to be able to buy and exchange seeds, uh, both in physical locations, so at farmers markets or in local communities, as well as digitally online. Um, and, uh, and to use this kind of multi-capital, multi-token multi currency. So not only can you buy seeds, but also you have voice. You gain voice through being involved uh, and, and participating in the community, you have reputation. You're able to actually, as you move from visitor to citizen, you're actually able to, um, 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 uh, you're able to, uh, as you move from visitor to citizen, you're able to vote, put up proposals, gain and, and kind of receive funding. And all this is happening all through a, a light wallet, which is pretty revolutionary in the, in the DAO space to have a, a wallet that's able to interact in this way. Um, but also cryptocurrency that's not really about making more money. It's actually about really trying to build regenerative economic systems now and doing so for the globe, with the global perspective. Um, the social infrastructure is really 
example could be um, it's open source citizen voted in uh, constitution, which offers a open source system for working, learning and living in a regenerative economic system now. Um, uh, not only is this kind of constitution open source and a lot of game guides and, and docs and books, but actually the whole technical infrastructure is open source. So anyone can come and fork or use or build upon uh, both the Tellus blockchain, but also the C's currency is wallet um, and all of this kind of global social governance works, make it their own and integrate that into their own environment, our own body of work, uh, which really kind of creates that ecosystemic feel that's there. And the third kind of infrastructure I mentioned was uh, organizational. So a good example of that is the Seeds Commons, which is a commons organization. So it's a peer-to-peer -peer member owned and managed fund that actually helps to support the coordination of individuals and, and organizations uh, to receive funding, uh, have right education, and to also kind of find and build community across the globe. Um, so whether you're a hyper-local project working in a very small community in place, or if you're running or managing a space, uh, you can have this global connection, a global currency, a global community, and a common place to be able to meet, coordinate, uh, receive funding, work from, all within this regenerative economic system. Uh, now, this is a thing that you know, exists now to be able to work in. Um, and so for me, the infrastructure of seeds embedded in the Web3 technology and ethos is kind of this, um, it's not only aspiring to, but it's also realizing the regenerative way of living um, and um, it has really allowed for an ecosystem of learning um, to live and to lead in new ways that I find to be deeply liberating. Um, so not only can you imagine that you want to one day be here, want to have access to this thing, if you are interested in regeneration, the affordability, the nature of the community being so open, it's open source technology and constitutions and, and this, the, it is a civilization that exists now uh, that anyone can step into. Um, and, and it's actually designed to be that bridge for, for, for anyone and everyone uh, across the globe. Um, so my kind of question that I was sitting here with and, 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 and living with was kind of like, you know, what is keeping you um, holding on to the shore in your life? And how can I or we or seeds help you flow into the river so that we collectively can lead, learn, and live together and celebrate all along the way? Um, that's my talk. Thanks. Thank you so much, Justin. Um, and th yeah, thank you for that reading at the beginning. That was really lovely. Um, so I think we've had a bit of a tech issue with Sarah. Sarah's um, dropped off the call um, and I can't get hold of her. Um, so I think we'll move into the next bit first and then hopefully if Sarah can rejoin, um, we can... Um, yeah, we can we can have Sarah say her piece after the after the next little bit. Um, Sarah, do you want to talk to us about the next little bit there? Yeah. So until Sarah gets back, we're going to have a five six minute breakout room conversation. And the reason we wanted to do this was to sort of surface some of the juiciest questions that we could then um, put to the speakers and one another after those breakout rooms and sometimes having having a discussion with others to hear their question can really um yeah surface some some really good questions so that's what we'll do now so i'm going to open breakout rooms in a second and justin fergus and deeper i have assigned you breakout rooms as well so i thought um there might be questions that you want to surface also for the other um speakers as well and i know i was thinking particularly about you know, where do seeds or um, Web3 or tokens, where do they meet community tech? And, you know, are you seeing overlaps? And yeah, so I wonder what questions you have as well. So I'm going to open these rooms and then we'll see you back in a few minutes. Recording. So welcome back, everyone. Um, we have um, been blessed with Sarah's presence again. 
the internet people have decided that Sarah can actually join the call again, amazingly. Um, so hold on to your questions and maybe see how your questions evolve through listening to Sarah. Um, but we're gonna give Sarah a little bit of time now to do a lightning talk. Um, Sarah, over to you. Uh, thank you. Yes, it's a good to be reminded of the realities of, of uh, tech, some of the challenges we all face. Um, so I'm somebody, I work in a number of different roles in different collectives and networks and communities of practice. Um, but I'd say that the common thread to my work is, is a desire to experiment um, with different ways of working, different ways of organising that disrupt power dynamics, challenge systemic oppression, um, and help us move away from our sort of defaults, the bad habits, the uh, competitive individualism that helped us get into the mess that we're in right now, and support us towards um, healthier collaborative culture um, and I'm interested in what's the role that tech can play in supporting that that whole shift um, and I guess I'm bringing a particular story to this session which is that as um, as part of the transition movement I, I work with um, a network of hubs so people in different countries around the world that are trying to find ways to connect people working on transition, on a just transition to a healthy way of living, um, and to support them to share their learning um, and inspiration internationally. And a couple of years ago, we recognised that we were facing a number of uh, tech-related challenges, and they really... I feel uh, that they're very linked, Fergus, to what you were speaking about um, earlier. Um, so these were some of the things that we noticed, uh, that each of our different circles and projects was using different collaboration tools. Um, and it was very difficult, you know, if you were, if you were working in more, more than one project, you were having to swap tools when you went to the next project. Um, and each of us were each of those circles were working in a bit of a silo. Uh, so what we one group was doing wasn't visible to others that were actually working in the same ecosystem. We were working on the same uh, change towards the same sort of change. Um, part of what we did was we organized interactive events um, uh, where people could come and explore a theme and share learning. And sort of the nature of our movement was we tried to do those in very collaborative ways. They weren't designed to be broadcasting information. They were designed to be supporting people to come and share their perspectives. And yet, because of the technology we were working with, the organizers of each event sort of had control over any follow up. You know, there was no. Um, we were wondering how could we dem democratize that process so that the conversations could continue and connect between events, but that wasn't all held by one small organizing team that, that anyone could continue a conversation. Um, we had a huge discomfort about the, the sort of corporate tools that we were using. We were using a lot of Google tools, Slack, Zoom, uh, somebody once said to us, well, you wouldn't organize one of these meetings in a McDonald's, would you? So, you know, why are you organizing these events within this, this um, uh, environment? Uh, and there was a sort of principle, you know, there was pain, it was painful uh, to be working in that, in those environments. Um, but there was also a practical issue that I think, again, you were, you were touching on, Fergus, of um, uh, we'd often get little discounts, you know, for our work from these, these big corporate organisations. They'd lure us in, make it almost free, or sometimes we'd be using the free versions of the tools, and then gradually what's possible 
within those free tools became more and more constrained, more and more limited until it was, they just didn't work for us anymore. And we had no control over that. We were, we were uh, sort of at the mercy of the marketing tools that were being used. Um, and finally, we had that sense that all of us in different levels of scale, uh, in different pieces of work, were all going through the same process over and over again of trying to assess what tools we should use. There's so many out there. They're changing all the time, of course. They're improving all the time. And we were constantly having to make choices about which to use. And we felt that we were, uh, yeah, we were um, making those, those assessments over and over and over in lots of different places. So we tried, we've tried to move more to a, uh, what I now will call a community tech approach. And we decided to create a, um, a collaboration platform where anyone in the transition movement and indeed anyone who was interested could connect and learn and collaborate at the international scale. And we had um, a ridiculously modest budget uh, and, uh, you know, pretty limited skills. But even so, we've, I've, I feel that what we've achieved has been really interesting. I mean, I don't think it's perfect by a long way, but it's been a really interesting process of learning what it is to take control of the tools for ourselves and design what we want in collaboration and cooperation with the many developers out there who are who are working with open source software. So we are now, we've now created on a platform, um, we've now decided on a platform, we've created a platform. Um, we're mostly working with open source, not, we haven't managed to do it exclusively on open source. So where we can't manage that, we try to work with uh, collectives and companies that are very value aligned. Um, but we're hosting this platform on our own servers and we're integrating different tools onto the platform. So we've got a, a situation now where people can come together and uh, create spaces for the different work that they want to do. Some of them are public spaces that anybody can join. Some of them are private spaces for a particular circle or people working on a particular project. But even when they're private, it's visible that they're there People can follow those spaces to find out more about what's happening in that space. You know, we're trying to work uh, with a culture of increasing transparency. There are some, there are some times when it's helpful to have some privacy to sort of quieten the noise, but we try to then be transparent about what's happening in each of these spaces and how people can then get involved. Um, and we've got a sort of this, this growing menu of tools that people can use for the spaces that they want to create. So we're, you know, we've started to have shared calendars, shared folders, um, easy uh, free access to video conferencing uh, in these different spaces, all of those things hosted on our servers and at uh, a ridiculously low cost you know I mean it's I'm sort of amazed at what we've managed to do with the, the tiny amount of money that's available and a lot of uh, some paid work and a lot of free contributions from people um, so we've currently got 28 different spaces in four different languages uh, so for me one of the really interesting pieces of tech that is an, an enabling piece of tech liberatory tech is just the ability to speak, you know, to, to have translation of what we're doing and to be able to talk to each other and understand more and more what people are saying through the, the translation uh, functions that are available um, and, and sort of chat functions, et cetera. We've got, we've, we're still very small. We've got about 170 users, but we're just going into another phase of, of attracting more people into the platform. We deliberately didn't move fast because we wanted to sort of build the culture slowly. Um, so I was thinking, what are the, uh, ten I'll come to an end, what were the tensions that feel sort of very live to me right now? And I, I came up with these three um, that we're coming across all the time. A tension between 
um, the need for simplicity, you know, ideally, you know, one answer to things, one type of tech, and then this huge diversity of needs, competences, and the different ways that people want to access tech. So that's a, a, a tension that feels very live for me. A tension between emergent and experimentation. You know, there's, there's something new becomes possible almost every, well, probably every day, but it comes to my attention at least once a month, something new we could do. And that sense of the, of people just not being able to keep up with that. And we, we can so easily overwhelm people by making new things available to them. And the tension between values and functionality. We're trying to entice people away from proprietary tools and they're used to things being very slick. And, and our platform isn't slick. You know, it's, it's clunky and we're learning how to use it. And when something goes wrong, we, we, we ask for help. And the sort of final question that I'm left with is how can we, on these, these platforms, as we develop ways of collaborating, how can we focus on culture? Because for me, that's as important, if not more important than the tech that enables what we do. How do we really make sure that we're sustaining a culture of reciprocity, uh, kindness, respect, and, and co-responsibility, rather than people slipping into a sense of they're the customers of this tech? This is tech that we all own and that we're all responsible for. And how we show up in those spaces is as important as what device we're using and, and how, how we access. Uh, that's me. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, yeah, really appreciate those tensions that you've named. I think it's really useful. Um, okay, uh, thank you. Thank you to all the speakers. That's been really helpful and really interesting to see the different angles and perspectives that you're all coming from. Um, I'm going to hand over to Zara now, um, who will lead us through the Q&A bit. Yeah, so we've got some minutes now for Q&A and hopefully some questions coming out of the breakout rooms. Um, and yeah, we should be able to get through quite a few. So if you want to either just unmute and go ahead or put your hand up and I can come to you um, and you can direct to a specific speaker or just to anyone who wants to catch the question, either is fine. Um, yeah, over to you. Fergus, let's go. So so you said you raised a question before we went into the breakout rooms about like uh, community tech and uh, Web three, and I think if you'd asked me that question a couple of years ago, I was really quite excited about it. And then working with other, with people in and around community tech sphere, we sort of I wasn't seeing that many great examples. But there's only last week the work that you'd had done with with Catalyst about Web three that really inspired me again to think that there there, there really could be opportunities. So I think I'd run a sort of deep uh, dig a bit deeper into the, the outputs of that work. But um, I just think that when you think about like um, a lot of community businesses set up as cooperatives or they're using things like sociocracy or other elements about how they make their decisions. And I think, you know, Web3 can really provide and smart contracting can really provide an alternative. So I, I do think there's potential there. It's just uh, I haven't really got the answer about of being able to point at these guys are doing it, but I do think that we're on the cusp. Mm -hmm. And so has the... Has the conversation for you so far, you know, with the fund, with the community tech fund and everything been, have the responses been much more Web2 so far? Or has there been interest from some of the grantees in Web3 as well? Uh, there's been there's been applicants in about Web3, Web, Web but there's been nothing that's been funded. So it's been, sorry, people might know that I manage a couple of funds as well. I've got one open now at the moment called Discovery Fund, if anyone's interested. So have a look at... Uh, how to change and have a look at our discovery fund but um yeah so we haven't funded anything any web3 but uh, i think this is part of the reason why i thought that actually this is going to happen because when you're when people are stuck within the normal governance streams of like you know of of working within a place the thing about web where web3 is it uh, sort of brings local globalization you know you could be anywhere in the world and be part of uh, a dao and like 
but when you work within a within a sort of place within a city or a ward it's not then you don't really see the the benefits of having that ability to like uh to be distributed isn't is, is to come to the fore but i still think there's value in it so it's just about how that uh how we work out how we extract that really mm -hmm. and i think i wanted to also ask you about i think you're saying um community tech sticks to a place and maybe this is also a question a bit for you sarah as well because it sounds like what you're doing with transition movement is really community tech creating your own solution but that's very distributed and very global are they two separate things or is it just that there's a place-based focus in the work that you're doing it um exactly that because like we, so we when we shared that definition for you that was like a, i remember how many definitions of community tech we came up with but they were all like very place-based and what we wanted to do is that we are looking at community tech from that place perspective but we want to we don't own the term community tech and like the, the stuff that sarah's doing and just to say Sarah, i was talking uh earlier and I was using the transition town like example, like transitions example about exactly all the stuff we've done. I've got uh, great respect for like the stuff Sam's done and all the stuff you've got in there. So that's really good. But um, yeah, so that's it. It's more the fact that when we look at it from a power to change and the work we're doing, we're looking at it from a place based perspective. But it's it can be shared experience. Could be yeah. Thank you. Questions from others. Dan, I know you had a question as well. And yeah, just either put it in the chat or raise your hand as well and we can come to you. Justin, go for it. I just want to hop in on the back end of that kind of hyper-local play space, meeting a global social uh, kind of system. Justin, I think there's like a very um, high-pitched parrot in the background or something. <laughs> It's okay. I, I, I'll, uh, I'll I'll try again later. Yeah, it's not good. It's not going anywhere. Yeah. See see if they uh, move on because it's very very piercing. And Dan, do you want to um, do your question in the meantime? Uh, yeah. I'm well. I've got a few. I, I think one of mine that was uh, present listening to Sarah at the end there was about this focus on culture um alongside technology and it made me wonder about um yeah the experience of the culture in like the web3 space and deeper your experience of like working in more decentralized autonomous organization structures where yeah you might not even meet the people that you're working with a lot of the time how how do you experience the culture from a yeah a lived experience kind of way? Yeah, no, I've experienced two very distinct culture, though I'm more immersed in the impact our culture, which is very non-financial. It's more around meaning and establishing the right kind of culture and going slow and really getting to know uh, the strangers that you are now aligning with on the internet, you know, while if you look at a lot of other DAOs which are related to decentralized finance or protocol are very money centric, like it launches with a financial token. So the very incentive to be in that decentralized organization is for the tokens and the speculation uh, prospects that come with it. So it's all the relationship is uh, basically all around money and and that's why DAOs uh, have gained this uh, you know the mainstream narrative has mostly been that they operate in a very trustless environment you know that smart contracts enable everything and all they've got to do is just you know don't even get to know each other but just vote uh, and that smart contract triggers the flow of funds based on that voting. But that's something that we've seen in uh, other types of DAOs because there are many different types of DAOs, but DeFi DAOs are mostly, you know, or NFT based, you know, the ones that are for speculative purposes, you know, those kind of communities operate like that mostly where they totally work in a trustless environment and they don't even, everything is authenticated by, you know, who can purchase that NFT or, you know, get that token. And uh, and the governance rights are based on that. And so it's based on affordability. While in impact house, the culture is very different because these are mostly started by change makers. And so the beauty of starting a DAO uh, and in the impact space is that you can go mission first. You don't have to take permission. You can just launch your idea on the internet and uh, galvanize the community around it, you know, and start, you know, start building and build in public and just socialize the idea and get your initial tribe in place. And then comes the question of how do you now decentralize with these people how do you account for the time and soulbound tokens or non-financial 
uh, like uh, non-transferable NFTs come into play because uh, it firstly helps build transparency. The record keeping of time is done on the blockchain and they're using level two, which is, uh, you know, layer two of Ethereum, which is mostly insignificant, basically literally uh, in insignificant uh, amount of money that's spent in transacting with the blockchain. So it's not that big a deal. And a lot of communities uh, are, have now started to use Solban tokens just you know, for basically offering different types of memberships, token gating to view content to, you know, for people of, you know, for donors, you want to do an event. So you can just token gate uh, that event for that donor, even subscription businesses, you know, they can uh, be given as um, NFT uh, or sold bond tokens, which essentially just means a visual representation of the hash on the blockchain that now you can carry in your wallet it's easy to display it's uh it doesn't live within one ecosystem it doesn't live on linkedin and you can take it with you different places and so it helps build your your identity in this more global world you know people can start building me you know at least have a base level trust uh when you show them that you have earned you know reputation from different places based on your contribution and so it's kind of like you know, the trust, it helps with trust building, you know, right now, there is no minimum level of trust. And it's not verifiable, you know, you can say anything on LinkedIn, you can create a fake page, and you know, you could say anything, but there is no trust otherwise, but this will help with that tr trust building. Mm. Because you can, you can, you can track who issued you, the NFT, uh, you know, the, the Solban token, what that organization is. So you can, it's all very traceable on the internet, uh, on the blockchain. Yeah. And I really, I really liked what you said, Deepa, about um, needing to earn your right to participate in the governance of a thing. Um, and Sarah, I'm interested to ask you, how does the sort of tech um, stuff that you've described that you've been making, how does that interplay with the governance of the transition movement? Uh, yeah, it's, so what we took, we had an existing governance model, which we took online to get us started. So we already had, uh, you know, a broadly socio soci sociocratic based model with different circles working um, and, uh, and what we call a, a heart circle. So a, a place where um, the different nodes in the system come together and explore what's needed next and resolve te tensions together. So we had a sort of functioning governance system that we've moved across, which felt like a good starting point, but you know, not everybody starts from there. And what we're now exploring, which feels the next phase for us is how to uh, broaden beyond those people who were already involved and who are already holding roles to actually make it possible for anyone who joins to step into um, to more of a role in supporting the platform. And I think it's a re it's really interesting questions about what's the threshold that people need to go go beyond for them to be then part of. Um, decision making you know there's the people anyone can come and participate but what is there a threshold before they become part of, of the decision making and we've we've got a system at the moment of creating sort of host roles in the different spaces on the platform one of the things we want is we don't we want diversity of spaces we don't want everybody to be having to do the same thing or even have the same governance and then the but so we ask yeah, anyone can create a space, but we ask them to nominate people as that they trust as the hosts, who then participate with others in sort of taking care care of the platform as a whole. So we sort of that's what we're developing. But I I feel you know I don't really know where we're going, and I think there's lots of questions about how to make it genuinely open without it being sort of easily hijackable if that's even a verb you know it can be hijacked by you know just one or two individuals with um who, who maybe don't understand the governance or don't know how to work in that way don't have the capacity to work in that way can really take up a huge amount of time and attention uh if 
if mm. they have access to everything from the from scratch. Mm. There's something really, really interesting in what you said about yeah, wanting almost different parts of the movement to be able to design their own governance, have like a diversity of governances. And my very limited understanding of, of Web3 is often that it kind of you design the process and then governance can happen within that. But Justin, I wonder if your if your parrot has moved away from you a little bit. I wonder if you've seen any sort of examples of, of that possibility for groups to yeah almost have a diversity of different approaches to governance but within a web3 model yeah i think you can think about so we think about like a dao you can think about it as like a like this kind of um centralized autonomous organization right so it has kind of a mechanical non-human um um vibe to it but i think about you think about a dao as a circle so it's really a, a, a boundary object <laughs> There's an inside, there's an outside. And what happens inside is like a, you can set up your own governance for it. But if I have <clears throat> two circles, two membranes in their meeting, we then get inside how we wanna govern ourselves, but also how we wanna govern together. And so every time these different cells in a body are meeting, they, they can each run through their own red, red blood cell, white blood cell, uh, tissue cell. They can all be true to who they are, but they can meet and form and kind of create tissue and organs or entire body. And so there's a real kind of uh, beauty, I think, in thinking about DAOs more like a cell that has a boundary object inside and outside. And each each inside can be governed in a way that's true to it, you know, based on its nucleus, based on the unique expression it has. And as these things come into relationship, each time a, a cell or a DAO meets another DAO, a circle meets a circle, you have the chance to decide and consciously choose how you want to govern together. And as you continuously find new ways of being true to your own governance style, and govern together, you really are able to build a really beautiful system, not only a network, but also a time of ecosystem um, that matches kind of how living systems already operate. Uh, so I don't know if that mm. if it kind of works, but I think it's really, it's more the humanness of the autonom the decentralized distributed authority versus the um, autonomy, which kind of actually allows for all those conversations, those journeys of governance, both inner and outer, actually allow for trust to be built <laughs> because the building of things together, the communication going from point A to point B, actually allows for trust to happen in a trustless system, which I think is actually a really beautiful part of what people are discovering in Web3 as a part of the response to the kind of the coordination challenge of, of getting work done globally while while living and honoring the place and the space-based nature of, of, of yeah of work. Mm, that feel yeah that feels really helpful. I know I find uh, metaphors always really help me think about these things that feel abstract. Um, Justin I wonder whether should we come back to your question that you had before as well? Yeah, I, I think it was meeting something around um, the question of like, is Web3 hype <laughs> or how does place and space meet? Um, and that's kind of what I heard Fer Fergus saying, like, you know, if I have a place-based community focus, how do I recognize or, or relate to what's the value in a global social infrastructure? And and I think that question, that question is a really beautiful question. And what I just wanted to say was that I think maybe the the thing that something like Power to Change has, or maybe like soul tokens, or maybe even transition, building your own software. I feel like all these are actually um, the practice of, of of bridge building between the two. So if Sarah gets like this space right here is a bridge between like a global social infrastructure, right? Huddlecraft is kind of like this offering a global social space, but we all have our place-based projects and perspectives and, and screens. And so these kind of spaces, these kind of journeys actually allow for each of us to do the work we do really well, but also to offer it up as a blueprint or a perspective that the whole can have. And that bridging happening, I think I think that's part of the Web3 culture innately, is it wants to find a way to be an infrastructure that runs throughout our day-to-day -day lives, do so at a global scale, and it's looking for opportunities to be able to find ways to, to, to come to that. And we found a lot of that in our work, right? Samara and Seeds is that, is that through narrative, through storytelling, through journey, um, you're actually able to build bridges in very unique ways. And because the, the orientation is toward, is toward decentralized and distributed authority, um, it's there's a lot of uh, cultural almost pressure or change that says, um, how can I look beyond my own? How can I see the whole? And then how can I find my place and my body of work within it? Uh, how can I be the bridge? Um, and I think that that's kind of Web3 culture as I see it in organizations like Seeds or, or Gitcoin or others that are really looking to to be and build a 
bridge that allows people to, to, to yeah, to, um, yeah, to, to, to see change locally uh, in place, but also to work in localities like online digitally um, and have that locality meet the local in ways that works. Mm. Uh, and th Dan, this might be massively dropping you in it, <laughs> but because at Huddlecraft, we've been um, running a web three immersion for nonprofits to explore the sort of potential um, for their charitable aims and, and this kind of thing. And one of the insights from that program that I thought was really interesting was around, you know, actually it doesn't necessarily need to be a shift from web two to web three. We don't need to be thinking so separately, but that there are ways to actually plug these tools in together. And yeah, Dan, I wonder if there's any more you can say about that having actually been there. Um, well, I think it was actually what um, Sam from Transition Network on that program was looking into, like how can um, like existing decision making tools that allow for consent, for example, like Lumio, I think he's interested in how that can be connected to maybe more um, decentralized autonomous organization functionalities around like tokens and incentivizing behavior and incentivizing participation or rewarding participation in in participating and contributing and through governance um so like sort of i think finding the compatibility between these different um platforms and tools i think is something that he was exploring further um, and whether they can be kind of meshed in a useful way uh, and the exploration continues i think yeah mm -hmm. Thanks, Dan. Um, I think we probably have time for one more question if somebody has one. And if not, giving space for it to emerge. Um, if not, Dan, I will hand back over to you to sort of wrap up and, and close. Giving space for a last question to emerge as well. <laughs> Yes, yeah, Sarah. I suppose a, a, a question that I'm uh, that that sort of feels alive for me is something about I just I just wanting to how the question of how do we bridge the gap between those who are at the cutting edge of this uh, you know these top techno tech explorations and just feeling how many people are nowhere close to that you know so experiencing that in my work that just to get people from one you know web two tool to a slightly different web two tool is a is a is a huge expectation and a huge process for them and to do that in a way that is supports culture change and yeah i, I, I it's not time to open it all up but for me that's one of the things the risk of I mean one of my roles in my project is to be the non-tech person who keeps saying I don't really understand what that means how will we make that clear to people that that don't know this um because that because the risk I, I see is of us just getting of a gulf getting ever bigger and yet I can really, I get really excited when I hear people like Deeper and Justin talk about what sounds, you know, this really interesting new environment. Yeah, I mean, uh, with AI, it's going to get even more challenging. My fear is that AI is going to lead us uh, some, I was on an AI Twitter spaces and they said the future is not evenly distributed. And the reason being because there will be people who will quickly start embracing these technologies and move ahead in life. Well, a lot of them will never catch on, you know, like they still struggle with Web2, right? Uh, at Salesforce, my job was to basically get nonprofits to use cloud technology. So I kind of understand the process of moving them forward. And uh, being in Web3 myself, like I've, I've been documenting a lot of Web3 social impact and documenting about DAOs and learning about them. But as somebody going on chain, I've been I've been slow. Like the first thing I ever got was a wallet because I think that's very important to log into different decentralized applications and it makes it easy because you don't have to remember multiple passwords and stuff and the second thing i ever did was to uh, issue sword one tokens which was very simple like somebody who's a non 
tech person, but understands technology, but you know, want to really use very simple interfaces of that technology myself. Uh, it was it was great. And uh, it, it even had an option to issue these tokens to people who didn't have a wallet. So you could just send it to their email, but that proof exists on the blockchain. So in the future, when they get a, a crypto wallet, which is again, it's not only for holding cryptocurrencies, uh, these decentralized wallets allows for a single sign-on across different decentralized applications. So you don't have to create passwords every time. And so uh, many people, like many chain, uh, many, I've seen like many people who've joined Impact DAOs, their entry point into Web3 has been through Impact DAOs. And the first thing they've done, you know, to get a feel for it is to go open, start a, a wallet. And so these, you know, later when they have a wallet, these NSP, SPDs or NFTs just show up in the wallet. And so that is, you know, easy to carry and it can have more big relevance. Like you can, it can provide identity to so many people who don't have identities and, you know, like uh, struggle with that. And, um, and the future is that even passports will move there, you know? So that's the ultimate future we're thinking of a borderless world where there are these decentralized big network states on the internet with their own passports and stuff. You know, there's a whole concept around network states that's taking place and small experiments happening there too. So yeah, I mean, I think it's very important to meet people where they are in Web3. Like I think Web3 as a whole has to realize that some of the tech is complicated. Like I find it hard, like I had to do a bridge between two uh, blockchains and I didn't know how to do it. So I just put out a question on Twitter and somebody helped me. But what if, you know, you are not ready to ask in public, then you struggle and you drop off, right? You never use the tech again. So I think Web3 has to do in terms of a lot in terms of simplifying it. But somebody who just used to issue like a Solvan token, it was a very easy process for me. I can, I can, I'll send, I'll put the uh, link to the protocol which makes it really easy. And so you can you can definitely go and try how easy it is. Great, thank you. Yeah, definitely share share all of the things that make Web3 more accessible and easy to get a grip, grip of, I think. Um, and yeah, we can share the work that we've been doing with Catalyst around Web3 as well. Um, thank you so much. Um, I feel like, yeah, there was loads of juicy information there. We'll share the recording with the people that couldn't make it live as well. Um, and yeah, if you're interested in what we're up to with um, the surge of peer learning and this, the next session, the final session in this event series is going to be on the July 27th. And we'll share a link to, to that as well uh, after the event. But just want to say, um, yeah, one last big thank you to the speakers. Um, thank you so much for all the wisdom that you brought and all the different perspectives. Really interested in how these two, all of these different things are coming together to create impact and change. And yeah, looking forward to reflecting on it myself and uh, getting more value through that process. So, so thank you so much. And yeah, have lovely evenings, everyone. Uh, take care. Thank you. See you again soon. Thanks, thank everyone. you. Bye-bye. All right. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye.